in it, Lord. And you said you would feed us, Lord, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. We don't have it all figured out, Lord. We need you today. And we give you the praise, Lord, for all that's going to happen and, and is happening, Lord, in this service. We acknowledge your presence. And everybody shout, amen? Come on. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. This service is in order. Come on. It's in order. Hallelujah. Thank God. What a great day. Turn with me quickly to Isaiah, the 10th chapter. Isaiah chapter 10, I want to read uh, one portion of Scripture and share with you today uh, something that, that I've put together that I believe the Lord gave me. So uh, Isaiah, the 10th chapter, is where I'll be reading from today. And I'm glad you're here, all of our guests. We welcome you with open arms. We're so glad you're in the house of the Lord today. Isaiah chapter 10, and I hope you brought a Bible today. Isaiah 10 and verse 27. If you don't have a Bible, look on with a friend. This would be a good time if you're single to look over on somebody's Bible and just kind of lean a little. Of course, that can work both ways too. Isaiah 10 verse 27 is a very important passage of Scripture. And I want to share it with you today and share with you something I feel like God gave me specifically for uh, this group today. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 10 and verse 27, if you're there, say, I'm there. Yeah. All right. I'm going to read it, and you just read it with me to yourself. will be fine. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder and, your, and the yoke from your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. It shall come to pass, one more time in that day, that the burden shall be taken off of your shoulder and the yoke from off your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, if that scripture makes absolutely no sense to you, don't panic. I'm going to tell you what it means right now. If you've ever had animals, you know that animals have to be tamed. And when you can't tame them, you use a yoke or a bridle or some instrument, farming instrument, to tame a certain creature or an animal depending on the nature of that animal. Some creatures can't be tamed. And, but in the days of the Bible, the common animal of any commoner was a donkey. Everybody usually, for the most part, had on a base level a mule or a donkey as an instrument to plow, as a, a creature to do work or even to travel. And so that is the, that is the symbolism of that verse, you see, that the, the, the writer is saying it will come to pass in that day. What day? In the day of the Messiah, in the day of the restoration of Israel, in the day of grace, which we're in, in the day of the new covenant, which we're in. In that day, he said, the burden shall be taken from off your shoulder and the yoke which would put upon an oxen or an animal from off thy neck and the yoke shall be taken and destroyed because of the anointing. Now we know that Jesus came and he destroyed the yokes of our life. We're not bound by sin, we're bound unto God. Jesus said in Matthew 11... He said, take my yoke. He said, take upon yourself my yoke. Use my yoke. Why? Because come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden or burdened down, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Matthew 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is the, a um, cross-reference to what I just read to you out of Isaiah the 10th chapter. Now, let's pray. Lord, anoint this service with great power, cause an attentiveness, and cause clarity of the word to come from my mouth. Lord, the, may the word of God today have free course. Amen. Um, this is Sunday, but what happens is in here today, there's a calm because this is a harbor. This is a state and a, and a city of peace. This is Mount Zion, you see. We're in the presence of God right now. And God's house is filled with his 
presence. And here you have peace of mind. You have quality of thought. Your heart is not necessarily in a, in a storm. But the moment you walk out of this room today, Monday will arise and will give way to Tuesday and Wednesday. And by the time you come back, many of you are beaten down, oppressed, suppressed, compressed, depressed, or possessed. And you're just, you're just riveted by the weak. The weak just pounds us. And we're fighting an enemy that is not inactive, he's active. Jesus identified him in Matthew 13 when he talked about the parable of the tares and the wheat. And an enemy had come in at night. When? At night. He, sneak, he did a sneak attack. And the enemy came in and he sowed tares among the wheat. So the farmers came out and said, Who hath done this? Jesus said, An enemy has done this. Say, You have an enemy. And that enemy is active. So that enemy produces in your life what I call simple burdens. Just normal burdens that we all endure. A burden is not when you don't have internet. A burden is not when you just had a bad day. That's not a burden. If you're complaining about your shoes, there's some guy with no feet. But it does not start out as a burden. It does not out start out as a burden. It begins as something smaller than a burden. Notice the language of the Bible. Now get this. Notice the language of the Bible. The Bible says that there is a process to how the enemy works and I'm just going to give you one quick formula. I'm not saying this is the only way. I'm just saying it's one particular way. He gets you and he gets you every time. And here's what the scripture says. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is found in Isaiah 61. In Luke 4, Jesus stood up and he quoted from Isaiah 61 as he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. They said, Where did, where did you get all this stuff you're talking about and he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he quotes Isaiah 61 and in that chapter verse 3 says this Jesus says translated he said I have come to appoint to them that mourn in Zion to give them say this with me beauty for ashes he said the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness now watch this check this out it does not start out in ashes. The devil doesn't come and, and, and incinerate you on the spot. Hello, I'm the, de I'm the devil. Could I offer you in a suicide? He doesn't do that. He starts with the most mediocre, common concern for your life. It's like the person who died before their time, the original attack came this way. You know you're getting old. You're probably going to die soon. It does not start out beauty for ashes. Listen to this. Jesus said, I'll give you beauty for ashes. Number two, oil of joy for mourning. And number three, garments of praise, physical, for the spirit of heaviness, spiritual. It starts out as a moderate concern that becomes a worry that turns to doubt that becomes a spirit of heaviness. Then it translates into mourning. Lastly, you are nothing left there but a bowl of ashes because you fried. You're burnt. You're toast. I'm done with life. I'm done with people. I'm done with this marriage. I'm done with my job. Well, you don't need to be broke. So you might want to hold off on quitting one job until you find it starts out as an inside job. The devil comes and he says, you know, you're depressed. And you, you, you couple with that. You do not combat that with faith. 
You do not open your mouth and say, I rebuke that. I don't receive that. And you don't reject it, you accept it. And now you don't no longer have the garment of praise. You're walking around with the spirit of heaviness. Next you're going to start moaning and then mourning. And then lastly, nobody can even talk to you because you're just sitting on a, a, a mound of ashes and there's nothing left. Listen, I want to tell you the problem before I tell you the solution. The problem is that the goal of the enemy is to entirely get you so yoked down that you don't even realize it. People talk to you or communicate with you, but you're so burdened down and you're so yoked. How do you know this, preacher? Because I've been in that moment a million times over. I've walked through this church plenty of times inwardly aggravated over things that did not have eternal significance. But the devil will trip you up over what seems rational. Let me tell you, when you can't fix people, praise God. When you realize you can't solve every problem, you can't even fix yourself, much less them, her, him, they. You can't even get your own miracle, much less their miracle. So listen to me. The problem is that the devil wants to get you so concerned. He gets you, listen, here's the trick. Here's the problem. The devil's goal is to get you yoked up with concerns that are legitimate. They're valid. Am I preaching okay? Not interested in your applause, I want to teach you right now. They're valid. They're valid. They're important. They're legitimate. You know you better worry about your rent. Well, that's a legitimate concern because nobody tends to want to be homeless. So you start thinking about your rent. Now, given your rent ain't due till 19 more days... But you concerned about your rent. And Jesus said, each trouble has its own, own allotment. Each day has its own allotment of trouble. He said, pray this way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things. All these things, all this stuff, all these demands, high demand, low demand, all this resource, all the supply. I need, I need a car, need of this, need of that, need of that. All these things shall be added unto you. You are overly concerned about rightful worries, but those rightful worries are going to produce doubt in you, and doubt's going to produce unbelief, and unbelief sends people to hell because it's a sin. Thousands of Israelis died in a wilderness because they had a heart that was full of unbelief. Unbelief is the enemy of faith. You don't need more faith. You need less doubt. Faith is that thing that says, I know God is able with no evidence to prove it. Amen. Preaching better than you letting on. I got legitimate worry. Well, welcome to life. Welcome to the world. Pastor, I got legitimate concerns about my life or the church or my family or my money. It's not your money anyway. I have legitimate concerns about my health. You should. Nobody likes to die. I don't want to go see the coroner either. But listen to me. If you're not careful, legitimate concerns will turn to a spirit of heaviness and a spirit of heaviness will get on the inside of you and you'll take off a garment of praise and if the devil can get you to retreat you'll go back but it doesn't start see it doesn't start in the incinerator you don't turn into ashes overnight see Lot's wife was salty before she became a salt block you'll get that Tuesday evening that's all right I'm good I'm not offended so listen to me let me just not preach but teach if you are susceptible and you are vulnerable to a critical spirit, and we all are, especially if you're married. See, when you get married, it's a new deal. Six months in, it's an ordeal. Six months later, you think you got a raw deal. A few years later, you want a new deal. If you are vulnerable to being critical to yourself or others, or you are always tempted to be negative or to find faults, 
listen to me. I'm not saying you're walking in sin, but I'm saying you have to be so careful with that because if you're not careful, an analytical spirit will turn into a critical spirit and you will be walking in pride. And pride comes before a fall. You ever, you ever get around a genuinely critical spirit? I'll, my favorite thing is when, is when negative people try to sell you a, a bill of knowledge or wisdom. In other words, you're trying to tell me how you're so brilliant, listen, and how you've, you've ridden this bull so many times. There's a Greek word for that, baloney. No way. Watch. So they trade. See, control uses fear as its ticket. Control will use fear as its ticket. Well, I'm going to tell you, you better do it this way or else. Or else what? Let me tell you something. If you walk out of God's kingdom today, it won't shake. If I fall over dead, God won't miss a beat. And this church won't miss a beat. Because if it's built on personality, it'll go down. But if it's built on presence, it'll stay strong until God sends a shepherd. Watch this, watch. Control uses fear as its ticket. You better do it. You better, I'll tell you what I'll do. No, 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 no. Fear, and I'm not talking about healthy fear. I mean unhealthy fear. But listen to me. It is, if you're not careful, a critical spirit will become demonic. It'll become a demonic. Where, watch this. Where you feel like the more you find wrong with people, man, the more holy you are. Oh, and the devil will say, there's nobody that's got the discernment you've got. You are so exclusive to how you see this. It, I, listen, this is my 17th year. I've been this person I'm preaching about, whoever they are, and I've been on this side too. It's much less expensive to not criticize where you have no experience. Now, Lindsay, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you have a baby. How would you know? You failed the physical. Are you with me? In Mark chapter 5, listen to this. Jesus is asked by a man to come to his home and to heal his 12-year-old daughter. Jairus says... Come to my house and heal my daughter. Chapter 5, verse 23. She, if you have your Bible, she is at the point of death that she may be healed and she shall live. This guy has a legitimate request for Jesus to come to his house. Jesus never denied present reality. He always spoke in faith. He never acted like Lazarus was not really dead. He said, man, he's sleeping dead as a Hank Williams song. He is dead as in dead, folks. But I'm going to go and I'm going to raise him up. He never stops. Jesus never stops where your faith quits. If your faith translates to him, he comes and says, you know what? You're four days late. In Jesus' mind, he's right on time. He does not live in time. He is in eternity seeing the end from the beginning. It's never too late. Jesus goes to this guy's house. Look at this crazy story. And as he's on his way, have you ever felt like God was about to do a miracle for you but somebody jumped ahead of you in the miracle line? <laughs> on his way, a lady with a legitimate worry touches the hem of his garment. Now the whole service is derailed. There's no Holy Spirit here. We're off track. We must need a new preacher. I don't know what's wrong with the board or the team or the singers. This church is going to... And here a lady interrupts the whole process. She touches the hem of his garment. Virtue leaves his body. She gets healed. A guy comes out of Jairus' house and says, Listen, don't worry about it. This is messed up. By now she's going to die. Don't trouble the master. Leave it alone. Jesus says, don't be afraid. 
only believe. Don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, Mercedes, only believe. Don't be afraid, Jesus said, only believe. And the original text says, just keep believing. Come on, y'all. Just keep believing. So watch. He gets to this house, and you know what's going on? What's going on in many of your life? There's minstrels, there's psalmists, there's funeral directors, and they're going, they're singing dirges of death and songs of sadness, and Jesus knocks on the door. Look, it's in your Bible. And he basically says, what are you all doing? Well, we've got a dead body in here. And like Moses said, we've come to mourn the dead. And Jesus is about to teach you that atmosphere has to be claimed. Atmosphere is neutral. Atmosphere is neutral. Atmosphere is governed by the laws on this planet. Atmosphere is governed by the laws on this planet. But atmosphere can be controlled. And if you control it in faith, you can claim the atmosphere, what you cannot see, and pull it into a realm that you can see. How do you claim the atmosphere? You put faith in your mouth, praise in your heart, and you say God is in control. You lift Him high and things will bow. Things will bow at the radiant praise of the Son of God. Jesus walks in and He takes on only three disciples, only three out of the 12 had the right spirit to help raise a dead body. Nine had to stay back in town because only three had the right spirit to not conflict the miracle. I'm not done preaching. And he said, could you do me a favor? Make all these people, help me preach, get out of of this room and Jesus said would you all please leave so I can claim this atmosphere oh that's not true why would Jesus son of God he can walk on water why does he have to claim an atmosphere well he went to his hometown and the Bible said he healed not many but only a few sick people because they did not honor him a spirit of dishonor will always cause the presence of God the dove to bow and settle but a spirit of honoring honoring God and love Loving and honoring people will welcome the presence of God. When we honor those God honors, come on, y'all. And but if we dishonor people, it'll quench the atmosphere of a miracle. Let me prove it. I've been in hundreds of hospital rooms where they were singing songs of death. And my mind, I said, there ain't no need for me to be here anyway, because this guy's gonna die. But I've been in hundreds of hospital rooms where they gathered around him and said, God is able, God is willing. My God's gonna raise mama or daddy back from this critical state and they rise up. Why? Because that family had enough spiritual insight to surround them and change the atmosphere of a hospital room and release that spirit of heaviness and bring in a garment of praise and there was no reason to mourn and there was no place for ashes because the man or woman went home. You've got to control the atmosphere. And six people watch Jesus raise a 12-year-old from the dead. Six people had a front row seat because the atmosphere was right. Wow. Let me prove how critical atmosphere is. See, when you got up here and did what you just did, or done what you just done, whichever is Englishly proper, when you just did that thing that you just did back then, you know, that you, you literally broke the atmosphere. Well, how do you have permission to do that? She's a woman. That should be a man's role. Hey, the first evangelist was women running from the tomb saying he's alive. Get over yourself. Come on, somebody. She's not taken from my feet for me to walk on or for my neck to rule me. She's taken from my side to walk with me. One time me and Lindsay was arguing and she, we argue. Come on, y'all. Uh, we, don't, we have highly heated discussions, theological debates or whatever. But our neighbors hear it, so it's pretty real. Um, so anyway, she, uh, she said to me, um, we were talking and, and when we were going to plant the church. And I remember, and she's like, well, I just, 
I don't know. I mean, are you sure and sure? I said, hey, just go with me. You know, the Bible says just, you know, submit. (laughs) You know what she said? Well, love me like Jesus loves the church. Shot down in a blaze of glory. I thought I had her. Atmosphere has to be taken. It has to be taken. It's neutral and it has to be claimed. If you get high off stirring the pot in people's life, that is a demonic spirit. If you get a kick out of watching people fall apart, That is a spirit of a demon that's operating in your life. Jesus went to a town that he was from. And you know what they said? Is not this a carpenter? This is Mary's son. And they laughed. They dishonored him. And here's what the scripture says. He could not do many miracles. The miracles were few in his own country. Only a few sick people were healed and he marveled at their unbelief. Listen to Mark 6. They said, is not this Mary's son, the carpenter from Nazareth, the brother of James, uh, of Judah, of Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Listen at this. They felt because they could genealogically trace who he was that they should have had an understanding of what he was doing. In other words, if we can't figure out why you're doing it, you're out of order because we're the supreme team. Jesus marveled, listen, at their unbelief and was only able to heal a few sick people. But we say God can do anything. No, He can. He cannot lie, and He can't work with rebellion, and He won't work in a spirit of unbelief, in an atmosphere of doubt. Well, look, well, we know you. I mean, you just Jesus. We, you know your mom or your brother, your sister right over there. And Jesus didn't marvel at their miracles. He marveled at their unbelief. So let me give you again how this works. Number one, here's how it goes. 99.399999% of the time, here's how it goes. Watch. You ready? We're going to open the chest cavity up. Here we go. Well, I'm just bothered. Well, be careful that we're not worshiping our bother. You know, I was counseling a, a friend one time, and he said, but you know, man, I just, I just feel like I... And I counted 76 times in five minutes, he said, feel. And I looked at him, and I literally, I was making a dot on the paper. And I looked at him, and I said, man, listen to me. You don't have to feel everything you feel. You don't have to own every emotion you're feeling. It all starts with a bother, a concern. It all starts as a small, look, little light, little breezy, little small offense. Then, after we're bothered, how many of you were bothered this week by something? Come on, put your leg over your head. How many of you were bothered? I, everybody, I just bothered. Who's, who's bothered before? Everybody been bothered? Who are the honest people? Of course you have. Of course you have. Number two, you start thinking about that bother. Come on. That just really bothers me. I mean, you know, the way she's saying, that bothers me. Well, don't worry about it. That just bothered me. You know, I've got all these kids in school. So, at least once a week having three kids in the same school, here's what I deal with. Daddy, there's this boy named, fill in the blank, and he told me I was gay and stupid and told me that, you know, that I was a a pansy. So that, you know, that's just kids in school, right? So I said, he did. I said, what would you tell him? I told him, I don't remember what I said, but I didn't cuss. I I, I told him. I said, okay, all right. 
So what I do, what I do, I say, well, buddy, you know, listen, don't get into it. But if he jumps on you, just, you know, you defend yourself. And I won't, you ain't going to be in trouble with me. But just don't be a bully and don't get bullied. Hello? So, but that child doesn't know that daddy's going to that school. I may not go today. Help me preach. But school's tomorrow, metaphorically. So I, I did this lest I go down to the school. I'm, and I, I do it like mayonnaise and peanut butter between bread. I slide it easy and thin. So I said, uh, Jaden, where's that kid you told me? He said, there he is over there, Dad. And, you know, he's hoping vengeance is Pastor Eric's. He's like, get him, Daddy. So I do this, do I not, on a regular basis. I probably shouldn't tell this on public streaming here for the school system. But I go to this kid. I said, hey. I said, what's your name? He's like, my name is fill in the blank. I said, do you know who I am? No. I said, I'm Jesus. <laughs> right now I'm Jesus. Hey, my son was telling me, come on, help me preach, on the playground that you were saying these words. Is that true? He's like, oh, no, Jesus. Come on. Oh, no, Lord Almighty. See, you're worried about things daddy's got in control. And if he don't do it today, he's going to do it. God's going to take care of you. That's why there's a thing called trust. Use it. But it starts as a small offense. Then it becomes a worry, a panic. Now it's a burden. Listen, and it's weighing you down. We had a lady one time say, I'll never be happy till she apologizes. I said, you'll never be happy. Because even if she does apologize, you're thinking that circumstances is going to make you happy. Let me give you a word that rhymes with rejoice. Choice. And if you're going to rejoice, you got to make the choice that your faith in God is bigger than your feelings and how bothered you are. You may not have shoes, but somebody ain't got feet. But with whatever you've got left, if it's ashes or mourning or heaviness, if you begin to praise God, fear leaves, the presence falls, and a miracle's coming. That works. You ever noticed how happy praisers are? And how miserable non-praisers are. See, praisers are not yoked. See, I didn't want to preach today. I wanted to teach. Because this church needs this. How you doing? Well, I tell you, I do, I'm real bothered. I'm, I'm concerned. Listen to me. We ought not to say, why, why aren't I further in God? We ought to say, why, why am I not loving more people in God? Whew. We seek position... We ought to be seeking presence. Whew. Good Lord. Don't get yoked. Let me stop this whole service and teach you the best way to get yoked up. Right here. Good person. See them? Good person. How's it going? Good. Hey, did you hear? Oh, hear about what? Uh, well, did you hear that? that um, did you hear about the praise team that so-and-so is pregnant and, and they think that they think that the other one's having you're kidding me. Well, you know what? I ain't never liked her. <laughs> See where this is going? See where this is going? We just went from gold to duct tape. See there? We just went from H high definition to 480. Can't see it right there. We went from clarity to foggy. Do you see that? Do not get involved with low level conversation because it will produce in your life an opening, help me preach, of doubt and fear. And when that comes in, you will walk in a spirit of faithlessness. You don't need, uh, you don't need in a sense less doubt. You need to hold to your faith in regards to what you're hearing. I had a guy come to me one time and he said this, that, and that, this, that, and other. He was giving me this whole story. And I said, well, hey, well, this was about a situation actually uh, uh, back home dealing with a family situation. And, and I said, well, tell me what you know about that person. Well, I mean, y'all talk to him three or four times a year. I said, oh, okay. Listen, when the voice of authority in your life hasn't left the zip code, you need to change authorities. Well, I've been to Hardyville. Everybody's rude. You know two people from Hardyville, and you formed a verdict off that. 
And I can't stand Hilton Head. You can't drive. Well, you all got to go over there at the Heritage at 5 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> tell it, tell it, tell it, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See, you, you, you're, you're given the whole summation based on one piece of evidence. And that's why your faith's lost. You cannot have a spirit of, spirit of heaviness in your life all the while you're praising. It will leave you. Don't take so much responsibility for your own success or your own defeat. And let me give you the number one rule for life. Here it is. Man, if I can't get this to you, this is straight out of Pastor Eric version 6.3, volume 1. Don't take things so personal. Man, I've had to learn that the hard way. And I'm still learning it. A spirit of heaviness will give itself to you real quick. It'll say, you like me? I can help you. Identify with my grief. Identify with my sorrow. Identify with my weeping. There's nothing wrong with counseling, but if you're not careful, you'll spend good money paying somebody to tell you what you want to hear. And there's nothing wrong with weeping, but watch. Don't let your weeping prevent your worshiping. Don't let your grief prevent the glory. I'm just so grieved. I'm just so grieved. I'm just so grieved. Uh, Robert Edge. Robert, are you in here? He's probably in the back. He at one time weighed 600 pounds. Can you imagine? 600 pounds that man weighed. He's 499 right now. Can you believe that? You know what it takes to lose that? Faith. Focus. Facts. You got to put it together. He said, I began to eat when my mama died. See, in grief, he had an identity and comfort. In this case, it was control food. He's not ashamed of it. He gives God glory now. So what, it, what is your thing that you could put in that docket? A spirit of heaviness will glue itself to you. It'll say, you love me? I love you. Come join me. Come on, let's cry together. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Is it that easy? It is when you let Jesus do the lifting. Faithlessness becomes sin and it'll produce an atmosphere of criticism. You exa for example, you go to the hospital and somebody says, you're not going to make it. 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 Without faith, you have a dead atmosphere. How do we find rest under a yoke? How can we find rest underneath a yoke? That biblically Jesus says it, but it makes no sense, does it? I'm almost done. How do we find rest under a yoke? How do we find rest underneath a yoke? I've got to tell you how I just found it. And I got a breakthrough in my life. There was a time, the old Pastor Eric, I'd be worried, concerned, and fretting, and panicking internally. This ain't done, that ain't done. Oh my God, we got to do this. Inside now, if I, if I don't laugh about it, I'll cry about it. How I many know what I mean? So I begin to rejoice over what God has done, not focusing on the things I want Him to do. What is most important is not new screens. I'm preaching to me. What's most important is not the walls, the building. What is most important is that people who are carrying burdens every Sunday can walk in here and meet a Jesus who has proclaimed that we cast our cares upon Him. My concern is that people are being helped and healed by Jesus and that God's getting the glory and all these other things will take care of themselves and that's coming from the guy who's most analytical is it that easy? it is when you change yokes you only find rest under a yoke that doesn't belong to you take on my yoke well, look at Pastor. This is going to sound, and it did for me too when I wrote it last night. Do you feel burdened down, stressed, worried, panicked, full of anxiety, and just can't see the light of day? Do you feel that way? I wrote this last night, and, and the Lord said, if you do, you're doing it wrong. What do you mean I'm doing it wrong? Did you just call me guilty for feeling the way I feel? Jesus said, listen, take my yoke. 
take my yoke. You're lifting and I'm walking, saith Jesus. Let me lift and you walk. Okay, okay. How do we find rest under the yoke that is easy and the burden that is light? Well, I want to tell you, and we'll go to lunch. I want to tell you, here's how you find an easy yoke and a light burden. Here's how you find it. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken off his shoulder and the yoke from his neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Well, let me take you into my world just for a second. You don't know how many times I've stood up in front of people like I'm standing in front of you right now. And on the outside I was doing this. But on the inside I was going, this is so dead. And they ain't nothing working here. And there is a lot of chicken in this pan with no oil. You get, the, you get it now? There's a lot of ball bearings in this tire with no oil. Woo, there's a lot of rust on this piece of metal. And we need some oil. Wow. Listen. The burden and the yoke will be destroyed because... Listen to Pastor... There is an unexplainable spiritual agent called the Holy Ghost that comes into ever gather, every gathering of the church of Jesus Christ. He is the only union leader that is present at every meeting. And he gathers when we lift his name on high. The Spirit of Christ, person of God, Jesus Christ himself walks in a room. He don't need a door because he is the door. And when we begin to praise Jesus Christo, the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the Israeli Jewish Gentile prince walks in and he begins to minister. And my part of this service is officially over because it takes the anointing of God to walk into a room and create a staple moment and produce an anointing and a cream and it's at that moment that we begin to cast, stand on your feet cast all of our cares on him and when you cast your cares on him the anointing comes, it is the anointing oil for every infirmity, malady, weakness of the human being's existence and it will heal you if you're sick it'll mend you if you're broken he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. Unlock the prison chains for the prisoners and produce healing to those that are broken. That's physical, emotional healing. We lift our hands because the anointing is here. Let's do it. We lift our hands because now, Lord, the yokes and the burdens that we are carrying we now have to cast them off or we'll begin to walk in a spirit of faithlessness. Whew. So with our hands lifted, Lord, whew, Lord, what I cannot control, I release to you. I give you every situation, Lord. I give you every person. I give you every family member. I give you every situation. I give, you, I give it all to you, Lord, today. I do what 1 Peter 5 and 7 calls. I lift my hands. I close my eyes. Or you can leave them open. I don't care. And I cast all my care upon you because you care for me. Did you know that word comes from the Greek word that means to rip apart, to tear apart? How many of you feel like you came into this place saying there's parts of your life that's trying to come apart? Come on. You're coming apart at the seams, you see. But the anointing is here. Whew, the anointing is here. And you're going you're to take those hands for just a few moments. And if you're carrying a burden, you cannot carry you feel like in a yoke that's got you just under the waves of the enemy 
I want you. Re- I want to release you even now to release that burden. Come on, join me in this altar. We're going to pray. Come on. We're going to break that thing. You're going to be free. Let's move. Come on. You're carrying something you are not designed or equipped currently to carry. If that's where you are, the Lord wants to remove that or give you grace through that. Hallelujah. Isn't this beautiful? Hallelujah. I praise you, Jesus. Pastor Matthew, come. I want you to come help me. Bryant, come help me. Mark, come help me. Unless unless you need prayer, then stay there. That's perfectly fine. I'll use these two guys for now. Pastor Matt, come right here. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus.